जादव सर यू मे बिगिन गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड ऑल आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर टूडेज डिजिटल गेस्ट लेक्चर बाय माई लॉर्ड जस्टिस बी पी धर्माधिकारी सर माई सेल्फ एडवोकेट प्रकाश जाधव मेंबर ऑफ सांगली बार असोसिएशन एंड ऑल्सो मेंबर ऑफ कन्वेर कमिटी ऑफ एल टी सी हियर टू इंट्रोड्यूस एडवोकेट वसंतराव पाटील लॉयर्स ट्रेनिंग सेंटर विच हैज बीन एस्टेब्लिश बाय सांगली बार असोसिएशन विथ अ ग्रेट सपोर्ट ऑफ सीनियर एंड जूनियर मेंबर्स ऑफ बार इट्स यूनिक सेंटर हैज बीन एस्टेब्लिश in the name of advocate vasanth rao patil who was a renowned criminal practitioner lawyer he was also president of our bar he had taken initiative in bar in his tenure to arrange conferences by involving foreign lawyers and also conducted many fruitful activities for betterment of the sangli bar association he added shine to bar's reputation our sangli bar vigorously takes initiative for such activities and our bar members always support unconditional so this platform established with a purpose to boost the confidence in budding as well as sl practicing lawyers to impart knowledge to inculcate discipline and overall development of personality of advocates is our motto i'm sure that with support of our bar association we will definitely achieve our aim of our betterment of legal fraternity thank you so much for joining now over to my good friend advocate anit sai hello everybody it is my great privilege to introduce sri bhushan pradyum dharmadikari former chief justice of the bombay high court justice dharmadikari was born on 28th of april 1958 after completion of his studies in law from the nagpur university he joined the nagpur bench of the honorable bombay high court he mainly practiced in civil criminal and constitutional laws at the nagpur bench of the bombay high court and also represented various government bodies and corporations justice dharmadikari after completion of around 15 16 years of his practice he was elevated to the bench on 15 3 2004 Justice Dharmadikari was made permanent judge on 12th of March 2006. Justice Dharmadikari, a popular and respectable judge in the Honorable Bombay High Court, was given further opportunity by his elevation as the 44th Chief Justice of the Honorable Bombay High Court on 28th March 2020. Justice Dharmadikari. was popular amongst the advocates for his patient hearing and considerate while considering all the submissions made by the advocates justice dharmadikari was always used to start his matter with the word yes mr and thereafter went to the logical end and decision in the said matter of course when he was against the advocate or he was not convinced with the submission of an advocate as a last opportunity he used to question the advocate anything else and then he used to dictate the order this made him very popular judge in the high court at bombay justice dharmadikari was elevated as the chief justice of the honorable bombay high court on 20th march 2020 and he hold the said post up till his retirement on 27th april 2020 it is very difficult to sum up the introduction of uh, justice dharmadikari in these few words but as we all are eager to hear justice dharmadikari on our today's topic of salient features of the mcoc act i will pass on to justice dharmadikari for for the session which we will be listening from him pass over to you sir thank you very much mr sai uh, at least two advocates who have appeared before me are today present in this webinar my friends we are all advocates some of us get opportunity to serve on bench it is a honor and to 
recognize it. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir, very much. Okay. I have always made it a point to give full opportunity of hearing to every advocate, more so if he's junior. And when I feel that now it is a time to pass order, only to ascertain whether the advocate has missed any point, I used to ask whether he has to add anything more, anything else. My friends, now this practice of working on bench has helped advocates, particularly junior advocates. And therefore, in my earlier lectures, I have made it a point to see that junior advocates receive benefit of whatever I could do on bench, whatever I learned about the mistakes, Many times because I found that a junior lawyer got LBW. That is, he could not open his case on merits and on some technical objections, technical lacuny, his matter was thrown out. His client suffers, the junior lawyer also suffers immensely because he is at the beginning of his career, the client may not come back to him and his reputation may be affected. So that was the reason why on earlier two webinars, I have tried to assist junior lawyers. Now, this time I was given a subject and therefore I cannot go back to it. Again, the effort will be not to speak much on the case law or law which is settled. I will try to share whatever I felt as a judge, as a lawyer while reading this law. Now, after this brief introduction, I will go to the law itself. As you all know, the preface or statement of object and reasons give us an insight into what the law contains. I cannot, for want of time, read the preface or SOR, but in the important parts thereof show that the legislation recognizes murders of tycoons related to film industry as well as builders, extortion of money from businessmen, abduction, etc. And because of this, the state legislature felt that the criminal gangs are working in state of Maharashtra. The Legislature therefore felt that there was immediate need to curb these activities. The important part of preface, which may have some bearing for us, is the existing legal framework, that is the penal and procedural laws, and the adjudicatory system were found to be rather inadequate to curb or control the menace of organized crime. Government therefore decided to enact special law with stringent and deterrent provisions. Now, my friends, I am not going to statement of objects and reasons because statement of objects and reasons again elaborates these aspects only. But we have to all keep in mind that whenever language of a particular provision or section is very clear, these SOR preface cannot be used to curtail it. So aims, objects, SOR are not decisive. Now with this uh, very briefly, I will deal with the various sections. Very briefly, I will not be reading those sections. Section 1 as usual is extent, etc. What we have to notice, this act is deemed to have come into force from 24 to 1999. An ordinance till then in force from that date was repealed by section 30 of the act. Then section 2 is about definitions. We have to deal with the section at some length little later. Sections 3 and 4 are again important for all of us about the punishment. As we have noted in the preface, the 
legislation contains special provisions those special provisions are contained in section 18 section 21 section 23 section 14 and about evidence presumption probative values etc you get sections 17 and 22 now all these provisions therefore which are specially made show that primacy has been given by legislature to stop the organized crime similarly there are some special provisions which ensure due execution of this act those are contained in sections 24 to 27 the shirking officers that is government officers police officers can be tried and punished and the bona fide acts are protected also it, it has got overriding effect and there is an important provision in the shape of section 27 which requires annual reports to be called by state government so after making this enactment it is not the end but the government has retained control by calling various reports from time to time to find out how the enactment is working how it is being implemented executed and to retain its control over it not only this but high court has been given powers to make rules so all this shows a somewhat departure from other enactments operating in the field now with this background i will go to the main sections with which we as advocates are concerned those are sections 2 3 and 4 3 and 4 are offenses and punishments section 2 is definition now at the beginning i will like to add that you get a distinct offense or a head being member and the act does not contain any definition of member this concept of being member is again materially different from concept of abetment abetment or harboring are also crimes and offenses punishable under section 3 now this act therefore contains reference to a bit concept of abetment any member and also any person now any person who is not offender abetter member is dealt with and punished under section 4 in certain circumstances we'll go to that also little later now therefore question is who is this member and how you have to deal with it now before proceeding further we'll consider grounds which are available in law to challenge the validity of any enactment lack of legislative competence the contention that any particular provision or act violates fundamental rights or article 14 are the grounds already available then the contention that the provision is manifestly arbitrary is also available this last submission that if a provision is manifestly arbitrary the legislation can be struck down is laid down by honorable apex court in swiss ribbons private limited versus union of india 2019 volume 4 scc page 17 now my friends uh, you are all aware of the judgments of honorable apex court which uh, look into this aspect state of maharashtra versus bharat shantilal shah and other 2018 volume 13 scc page 5 and 2010 volume 5 scc page 246 zameer ahmed latifur rahman versus state of maharashtra delivered on 23 april 2020 are the judgments which look into this aspect of legality constitutionality and also the last judgment considers the doctrine of pith and substance we all that there 
the challenge was to addition of ground of insurgency as an organized crime and contention was this insurgency is already dealt with in some other central legislation mcoc therefore has been held to be constitutionally valid in these two judgments now my friends in state of maharashtra versus bharat chandilal shah it has been held that in any provision in criminal law mens rea is always presumed as integral part of penal offence of section unless it is specifically and expressly or by necessary intent excluded by the legislature now this position in law assumes importance when we look at the position of a member in this act in this judgment of bharat chantilal shah the constitutional validity of section 2 b e f and also section 3 and 4 of mcoc were before the honorable apex court the other important judgment is colonel prasad shrikant purohit was stated that is 2015 judgment and there the question which has been gone into is whether cognizance of earlier two offences as mentioned in the definition of section 21d was duly taken within the preceding period of 10 years now again i will not go into parts of this judgment but there the important observation is a minute reference to said section therefore shows that in the event of fulfillment of rest of the requirements namely the nature of offence providing for punishment of 3 years and more the involvement of the offender as required under the said definition when it comes to the question of filing of charge sheet the requirement of such filing should be before a competent court within period of 10 years now why i am pointing out these requirements is will be dealing with this section 21d at some lane when i'll be sharing whatever i feel about it with you the other important part in this judgment is charge sheet before the competent court and such court taking cognizance of such offence it can be stated without any scope of controversy that two earlier cases now kindly know what the honorable apex court says earlier cases that two earlier cases which would attract a punishment of more than 3 years and prohibited by law undertaken singly or jointly as a member of organized crime syndicate or on its behalf little later i will comment more on this now with this i will come to whatever i feel about the material provisions in this enactment that is section 2 3 and 4 will be dealing with this section separately now clients are mostly concerned with offense and punishment so before going to the definition section will deal with section 3 now section 3 subsection 1 and it has got two parts that is first is roman 1 and roman 2 punish those who commit continuous unlawful activities i will call it tula cula section 3 subsection 2 is punishment for abatement abating section 3 subsection 3 is about harboring concealment etc section 3 subsection 4 punishes a member section 3 subsection 5 punishes a third person holding crime proceeds now my friends when we read section 3 the first question which arises is if organized crime itself is not proved what happens whether this act permits punishment for abatement though organized crime is not established 
or means that you cannot punish an offender under section 31 whether you can punish other person under section 32 that is a bit mean or then whether there can still be a punishment as a member section 4 you are all aware is about one minute only punishment for possessing an accountable wealth on behalf of member of organized crime syndicate and kindly note how widely this section has been worded it reads if any person on behalf of a member so kindly note it punishes any person who is not a member so these are the provisions which deal with offences and punishments now with this backdrop we will go to first definition that is organized crime syndicate now organized crime syndicate according to me material words or keywords in this section are persons and acting singly or collectively as a and lastly in activities of organized crime the question before me after reading this section was how one finds out what constitutes organized crime syndicate we'll come to this question little later but then as i have said organized crime syndicate means a group of two or more persons who acting either singly or collectively as a syndicate or gang indulged in activities of organized crime now activities of organized crime is again a very wide phrase it is not only organized crime activities of organized crime so does it mean right more than one organized crime or then it means in various steps which may lead in completing any organized crime even a single organized crime because activities of organized crime is according to me a word which points out any activity which by itself may not constitute an organized crime but may be a step taken initiated for accomplishment of that organized crime now with this we'll proceed further and try to find out whether filing of two previous charges that is two earlier charges is sufficient to show that a organized crime syndicate that is syndicate or gang exists now for that we have to find out what is organized crime now organized crime again is defined in section 2 sub section a and this organized crime uh, crime the keywords are i will read the definition because it is necessary but then keywords are any then by an individual singly or jointly as a member or on behalf of now my friends before proceeding further i will again emphasize because you may not have understood or in this medium it may not be possible for me to uh, guess what you are feeling about it by an individual singly or jointly this concept we'll have to understand in the backdrop of very same concept or its shade appearing in section 2d which defines continuing unlawful activity now the 
questions which arise before me i will be answering those questions or i will rather consider those questions little like whether concept of section 34 which is relevant under ipc offences will be relevant here when we consider question of organized crime then this assumes importance because you get punishments under separate heads that is for committing organized crime under section 31 for abetment under section 32 for being member under section 34 and so on for harboring under section 33 for holding property under section 34 now with this we'll go to very rather cardinal definition important definition in this act that is section 2d which defines continuing unlawful activity what i called as chula now here again keywords are undertaken singly or jointly as a member or on behalf of now these words undertaken singly or jointly need to be contradicted or read in contradiction with similar concept which is employed by state legislature in section 2e defining organized crime now organized crime as i have already read see me i am reading the definition means any now kindly note this word any continuing unlawful activity by an individual singly or jointly either as a member those are the latter words we are not concerned what i am emph- putting emphasis is by an individual singly or jointly so by an individual singly we can understand but by an individual jointly how are you going to explain this what is the implication of this by an individual and jointly when they are put together so mere participation as a member of group is envisaged in section 2e or then section 2e requires something more that is more active participation some positive act and therefore i made reference to use of section 34 ipc with the section 34 ipc will have some relevance or may not have any relevance in so far as this aspect is concerned now section 2b as against this defines continuing unlawful activity now this you have to note means and now organized crime uses word any continuing unlawful activity here the word used is an activity prohibited by law for the time in force which is organized uh, which is cognizable offense punishable with imprisonment of 3 years or more undertaken either singly or jointly now here they do not say that undertaken individually singly or jointly so when it comes to organized crime the individual role has been given some importance section 31 which punishes for organized crime therefore punishes an individual now you all know that this act does not contain any provision which prescribes a special punishment for gang leader that is head of the syndicate it also does not contain any provision which will permit state government to frame a charge sheet or file charge against syndicate syndicate is not even legally recognized artificial person a legal person so the role of individual in the scheme of entire mcoc becomes very important you have to therefore try to understand words singly or jointly in section 2e and read it along with 
undertaken singly or jointly in section 2d this word by an individual is missing in section 2d and what is the scope or why this has been done how it needs to be addressed to how it needs to be understood is for the lawyers to gaze to study and to assist the court in pronouncing a proper verdict on it section 2e according to me speaks of personal role of an individual and positive action even in joint move why section 2d speaks of collective involvement that is section 34 or section 149 ipc may be relevant in section 2d now just before proceeding further i will take some illustrations a syndicate crime syndicate or gang has a paid driver who drives the family members to market school etc he also drives gang members occasionally to bank to builders that is offices of builders he is not aware whether gang members would commit decoity or murder or collect ransom though he is aware of nature of activities carried out by gang driver carries a member to a bank where some money is to be withdrawn gang member meets a builder in the bank and kills him in the bank which offense the driver has committed now here therefore he was not aware that any offense is to be committed in bank he was aware that he is driving a gang member to bank but in that bank a gang member was to withdraw money from his account in the bank so he was not to commit any offense nobody could have perhaps dreamed that a builder would then be present in the bank or then there will be some dispute some quarrel or then for no reason this guy member could murder or kill the builder there now fact that this person is a driver he is aware of existence of gang is proved but then his involvement in the crime is not there so can he be punished under section 3 4 where being member is a distinct and separate head of punishment or offense now same facts but then driver agreed to carry gang member to a bank where builder was caught and then there the builder was shot the facts undergo slight change therefore here driver is aware of the design now third set of facts a young boy is hired by a gang member for killing a rival that young boy is not aware of either gang or dispute relating to rivalry what is the offense by young boy can you say that he is part of continuing unlawful activity or organized crime or then his offense is only under section 302 to me if he is not aware of gang if he is not aware of any unlawful activity and he only knows the gang member as his master who has paid him for that killing his offense will not be an organized crime at all now last illustration which i am taking is you get a gang which has got various businesses like contract killing recovery of possession from tenants or other persons threatening builders or other persons from ransom abduction decoity etc now gambling is also one of its businesses activities individual who is aware of gang activities participates only in gambling business how you will place this individual will he be a member of organized crime syndicate now therefore to me when we look at the definition of 
continuing unlawful activity. The important words which need to be looked into are more than one charges in period of preceding 10 years. And then there is one more word in respect of which the earlier charges should be therefore against some member of the gang or its leader. Now, what is the relevance of 10 years? If we go by various judgments, settled law, three offenses need to have taken place in 10 years. If there are three offenses in three months, what happens? What is the relevant or important aspect of the matter? We have looked into preface SOR, whether it is number of crimes which is relevant or whether it is period that is 10 years which is decisive, which test we will have to apply. Now, again, I will just take an illustration. A trial under MOCA is going on. And during that trial, prosecution learns about an old offense which has not been investigated into. If the charge sheet about that old offense is filed, what happens? What is the effect? One more question. If there are two earlier charge sheets and in trial for those two offenses, there is acquittal, what is the impact? This therefore has got some importance on the scheme of section 2D. What is the effect of acquittal in earlier offenses? And how are you going to deal with it? Now, we have all looked into section 3, subsection 4. We have also looked into, very briefly, the special provisions. Now, those special provisions change the entire perspective in so far as criminal jurisprudence is concerned. The probative value undergoes change. The presumption also goes against accused. Not only that, in section 22, in certain situations, burden is cast upon accused. Now, if this is the position and if there is acquittal in earlier two charge sheets, what will happen? that you have to understand and then try to explain what is the meaning of this enactment, what is the purpose of this enactment and how it needs to be implemented. Now, section 34, therefore, when it prescribes a punishment for being member, the punishment is for membership of organized crime syndicate. As I have said earlier, there is no definition of member. Now, this concept of being member is again different than abatement. Abatement is defined in section 21A. But then abatement or then the participation in preparation, etc., advocating is made punishable in section 3, subsection 2 and harboring is made punishable in, in section 3, subsection 4. So, harboring, conspiracy are different aspects. Now, in this situation, therefore, when very wide words, because section 4 I have pointed out, it speaks of any person and the legislature has therefore gone uh, means rather far ahead to frame an enactment to formulate a law which will curb the menace of organized crime. Now, in this scenario, therefore, you have to understand what is this membership. There cannot be any proof of membership. Here, this is a criminal business. So, nobody will be paying some monthly subscription. There will not be any receipt. So, abatement and harboring are the concepts which are crime specific. Membership is therefore a floating concept fact that this person is associated 
with a particular gang since last three years, four years, will be sufficient perhaps to establish membership. A fact that this person was writing accounts, a fact that this person was working as a pun, as a security guard at the office of the crime syndicate gang will perhaps therefore be indicative of his membership. Membership therefore has not been deliberately defined. Membership appears to be a concept which has been deliberately left open to interpretation and anybody who is associated with gang will be involved in it. So a person who is not actually associated with any organized crime or organized crime which is under trial may still be punished as a member if his association as a member with the organized crime syndicate is established. Now, section 4 therefore refers to a stranger when it says any person. This any person in section 4 did not have any past association with syndicate or its member. And when we look at all this scheme of section 2, section 3, section 4, what I feel is you have to take note of the fact that section 3 uses the word whoever. Just look at uh, section 3, section 3, subsection 2 I am looking at. Whoever conspires, section 3, subsection 3, whoever harbors or then section 3, subsection 1, whoever commits. So whoever therefore is again a word of wide amplitude. But then whoever in section 3, subsection 3 excludes member. Section 2, 1, Roman 1, section 2, E, section 2, F, section 3, 4, section 4, all these provisions employ word person. Section 3, 4 employs word any person and this any person is member. Section 2, F employs word person, but then this person excludes member. Section 4 employs word person. It refers to a third person who is not member. Now, with this, my friends, I will come to whatever I have to say on, about section 2D, continuing unlawful activity. If uh, you can have the provision in your front, it will be convenient for you. Continuing unlawful activity means an activity. Now, an activity means singular. Prohibited by law for the time being in force, which is cognizable offense, punishable with imprisonment of three years or more, undertaken either singly or jointly as a member of an organized crime syndicate or on behalf of such syndicate in respect of which. Now I am going to put emphasis on this word in respect of which more than one charge sheets have been filed before a competent court within prescribed within the preceding period of 10 years and that court has taken cognizance of such offers. Now, my friends, effort will be to understand the scope of these words in respect of which I have tried to point out to you only one judgment where the Honorable Apex Court says that there need to be previous two charges. The same view is taken by Division Bench in October 2019 in case of Sudhakar Sutar. You must be aware of that judgment. There are two judgments 
of one of just uh, when mr sial this is delivered by justice ardas he was he has earlier written a judgment in case of taru so that uh, judgment in case of sia and one more judgment again by justice ardas all this proceed on this basis that there has to be two previous charges one of the judgments the court also says that competent court means a court competent to take cognizance of the charge sheet as previously filed you may be aware of that judgment i will not like to comment on it but competent court is not the concept in ncoc mcoc speaks of special court and section 2d speaks of a competent court in section 2d where it says more than one charge sheets have been filed before a competent court now my friends my effort will be to point out to you what according to me may be the meaning of section 2d now charge sheets have been filed what is this have been filed if a charge sheet was filed and it has already ended in punishment perhaps it is not a charge sheet which has we we can say charge sheet have been filed if a charge sheet was filed trial is over and the accused persons are acquitted again we cannot say that charge sheets or charge sheet have been filed more than one charge sheet have been filed to me this concept that charge this words that charge sheet have been filed or has been filed therefore denotes a position in which the charge sheet has been filed but trial is still pending there is no adjudication now what is the meaning of in respect of which these words in respect of which in section 2d they qualify the activity prohibited by law therefore section 2d contain uh, rather contemplates a charge sheet which has been filed for an activity which is continuing and lawful activity the definition is in present tense continuing and lawful activity means an activity in respect of which more than one charge sheet have been filed this does not say that any earlier activity so any activity in respect of which a charge sheet has been filed becomes a continuing unlawful activity provided you are in position to show that other ingredients or in that definition that is it is there were more it is more than one charge sheet and in preceding 10 years are satisfied so continuing unlawful activity does not refer to only one activity that is third offense it takes within its sweeps even the earlier activities that is first so called first charge sheet or second charge sheet again here we'll have to consider whether it is uh, as per even settled law it is necessary that there should be minimum two earlier charge sheets language is very clear more than one charge sheet it does not say two charge sheets now it is right to say that two means more than one but then language used by state legislature is in respect of which more than one charge sheet so an activity in respect of which more than one charge sheet so there must be an activity 
in respect of which more than one charge sheet has been filed. So one charge sheet, the second charge sheet which is under consideration, therefore even as per sector law, may constitute a QLA. But then this will require more study by the advocates, more thought, and then some better arguments so that court can look into it. But frankly, for myself, I feel that present interpretation that it has to be third offense. So if there exists a gang which has committed only two offenses after the act came into force in 1999, that does not mean that that gang cannot be tried under this act because it has committed only two offenses. More than one offense will be sufficient, but then even for first offense which has been committed after 24 to 1999, there can be a charge sheet under NCOC. What is the definition in section 2D? Continuing unlawful activity. So activities continuing. How activity continues? First charge sheet, more than one charge sheet, and therefore it is continuation of unlawful activity of that gang or syndicate. So this continuing activity has been dealt with. So we cannot say that unless and until there are previous two charge sheets or previous two offenses, or then only third offenses, the third offense needs to be viewed as continuing unlawful activity. If there is no third offense, there is no continuing unlawful activity. Now, my friends, therefore, when we look at this definition, and if the position that even for earlier charge sheets, if offense has taken place after the act came into force, first charge sheet or second charge sheet is for offense which has been committed by a gang after that date. Fact that gang has committed third offense may not be very decisive. Fact that it is continuing needs to be established and a latter charge sheet that is more than one charge sheet has been used only to show as habit or the proof of continuing unlawful activity. In civil law, we are all aware that when you say that a tenant is defaulter, you have to show mental habit. So you have to show defaults. So only one default is not sufficient. So I think that similar type of approach, similar interpretation is necessary while understanding section 2D, an activity which is spoken of in opening part of section 2D, therefore is qualified by the words in respect of which. So activity in respect of which more than one charge sheet has been filed encompasses within itself the first offense and offenses thereafter up to the offense when police comes to know that there is a gang and it has to proceed under MCOCA. My friend, there is one more aspect. Normally, when an offense takes place and a person goes and lodges a report in police station, he may not be aware that this offense or crime is committed by some gang. He may only lodge a report. Police may also, in after some investigation, file a charge sheet. At that juncture, fact, that this is offense by gang may not surface. It may surface later on. As you have seen, there is there are some technical compliances which need to be done under section 23 before the provisions of MCOC are applied or then before the court, special court takes cognizance of such offense. So those compliances will require some time and therefore it does not mean that second charge sheet which has been filed cannot thereafter, after complying with these provisions, be treated as a charge sheet for continuing unlawful activity. In my humble opinion, even first charge sheet can be looked into as an instance of continuing unlawful activity and the trial therefore must be for continuing unlawful activity. Trial may not be only for third offense. Now, my friends, uh, 
with this uh, i will not like to say anything more on procedural part but uh, while looking into this enactment and various judgments i myself felt that something needs to be done i myself entertained various doubts and whenever matters were argued before me if the doubts were relevant i have put those doubts to bar i have received also some cooperation but there are some aspects i may be wrong i may, may be right but then these are the aspects which continue to trouble me and therefore when your esteemed association gave me opportunity to address you on this enactment i accepted that opportunity and tried to place it as briefly as possible before you i think i have already taken more than 50 55 minutes i will uh, stop now and uh, leave it to organizers to find out how uh, the because there may be some questions i will like to answer those questions to the best of my possibility thank you very much wish you all the best thank you sir for such an insightful and enlightening session this session has cleared many of our doubts in respect to mcoca act it was indeed a very knowledgeable lecture sir so our feed is flooded with questions from advocates all around the country with your permission may i ask few of those questions yes sir first question comes from advocate hemant dubey he questions that if the police charges the accused under mcoca act are there any guidelines which the police officers have to follow for obtaining the confession from the accused as the police officers could resort to violence or mental torture on the accused in such a scenario would the confession be admissible or not in the court so section 18 is there under section 18 there are rules also framed by state government those rules contain elaborate procedure what the police officer has to do the confession needs to be recorded by a higher police officer there also there is a procedure that police officer has to initially put him some questions which are not on merits of the offense then give him a time to ponder to think over whether he still wants to give confession so the person is made aware that he need not confess he is also made aware of consequences of that confession and then he is removed from custody of investigating officer that police station he is placed in custody of some other higher police officer at some other place where there will not be any influence pressure upon him he is so during this period given to him to cool off he can again reconsider everything and on next day that is after more than 24 hours he is again produced before that officer there again he is put some questions with he is asked whether time of 24 hours given to him to rethink was sufficient or he needs more time if he says he needs more time time is again given if he says no he does not need time then only his confession is recorded immediately after his confession is recorded he is sent to a judicial officer along with that confession and there again judicial officer puts him some questions so that way the law is very certain and steps have been taken the young advocate who has put this question has to look into those rules if there are any violations those violations can definitely be pointed out to concerned court at the earliest possible opportunity here the position is after confession is given confession can be relied upon and used to punish the accused but then even a retracted confession can also be used so there is already huge case law in this respect i will request that advocate to look into it yes next question thank you sir thanks a lot uh, so the second question comes from advocate shivangi saxena she asks if the provision of, of mcoc act are invoked and one is booked under the act he she is no more a suspect but is guilty until proven innocent even after a year court decides that there is no case against the person and discharges him what remedies would the person have no 
the burden shifts only if ingredients of section 22 are satisfied now if there is a confession of by this person or confession of some other person pertaining to this accused person he may be detained in custody he may not get bail because of the mandate of uh, section 21 other legal provisions but if ultimately if he can establish that this was malicious prosecution then he can take appropriate steps if there is misuse he can also approach police authority for malicious prosecution he can recover damages as we all know for malicious prosecution a civil suit also can be filed and limitation for it is only one year yes noted sir thank you so the next question comes from advocate pramod sutar he asks that very often we find that mcoc act is charged even if the accused is the first offender and his role is very limited is it a high time to direct investigation machinery on the application of mcoc act by issuing guidelines no first offender is not very decisive here if he is member of gang or if he associates himself with a gang it may be his first offense but it may be third or tenth offense of a gang so fact that it is his first offense is not decisive relevant uh, there are some judgments which means uh, the judgment in case of uh, that what is that sudhakar sutar or sudhir sutar which i said division bank judgment he delivered at bombay in october 19 it again uh, uses for a same analogy that name of this accused does not appear in any previous charge and therefore he is given benefit but this is not correct if he is a member he may not have committed any offense fact that he is member is by itself an offense under section 3 sub section 4 and he can be charged under mcuc yes so with your permission may i ask couple more questions yes yes thank you sir so the next question comes from advocate swaran singh he asks that section 213 of the mcoca bars pre arrest bail but a trend is seen whereby pre arrest bails are granted by courts whether courts are empowered to grant pre arrest bails and under the circumstances circumstances can we clarify the position sir no no you see courts are there to protect liberty of an individual article 21 is paramount this bail is denied when participation in crime or fact that this person is member of a gang can be seen from record now if material therefore demonstrates that the person has participated in crime or then he is a habitual offender or then he is member of that gang perhaps he may not be entitled to bail but when court find that no there is no such material against him police got ample opportunity police has investigated <coughs> oh, sorry police has investigated for a long time police could not uh, dig out any material against him and it is violation of his liberty the court may grant bail so it is power of court and if uh, somebody is aggrieved by this use of power by court he has to challenge that judicial order further in accordance with law yes noted sir thank you the final question comes from advocate sachin mane sir uh whether the sanction accorded under section 232 of the mcoca would be rendered invalid on the ground that the prior approval under section 231a was not obtained for recording and information about an offense these are two different things now 232 sanction is by a higher officer the officer granting a previous sanction is situated or placed below that officer who is granting this final sanction based upon this final sanction the cognizance is taken by court so this lacuna by itself will not be fatal thank you sir thank you sir for giving your precious time to us now i shall request advocate dr sheetal for the vote of thanks oh thanks sir 
Thank you, Sagar. Thank you so much. Um, this session indeed, sir, I must confess, was extremely exceptional and remarkable. Uh, at this outset, I just want to, um, I just remember one thing. We were on initial talks with sir about the topic and we requested sir to speak upon uh, MCOC Act. Um, I guess without giving a second thought, sir was all affirmative to guide us on this topic. And so I must say this is absolutely an expression of a humble and a knowledgeable person like you. I would express our heartful thanks to you, sir. So today's session was an absolute indulgence and it was so natural as it was in so much of depth covering the whole MCOC Act. And this definitely has not only guided and enlightened the trial court lawyers and advocates, but also the high court and Supreme Court advocates who are present on this very platform of ours. So I, on behalf of Vasantra Party Lawyers Center, as well as Sangliwar Association, would like to take this opportunity to thank you for accepting our invitation, as well as having your resolute presence amongst us. I further earnestly thank you, sir, to guide us in such a noteworthy day. Thank you so much, sir. Further, I thank Sangli Bar Association, who always remains uh, the Lawyers Training Center's booster. They've always boosted, this Bar Association has always boosted the training center to organize such sessions. I must thank today Advocate Prakash Sadhav sir, Advocate Amit Sare sir, and Advocate Sagar Rao sir to handle this session so well. And of course, Advocate Vikram Parmar, who remains our support system to handle this session technically so much without a flaw. I also thank our own mentor, Advocate Sudatta Patil sir, and his entire team to make this possible to organize um, sessions of such stalwarts and luminaries on this platform. Finally, I would like to thank, on behalf of our Santra Party Lawyers Training Center, all the audience who always maintain the role of being the motivators to this training center. I thank you so much all for being here on this platform today. So I would like with your permission to conclude this session and declare this session uh, to be uh, completed. Can yes, I? Yes, thank you. Wish you all all the best. Thank you so much, sir. I declare the session with sir's kind permission as being concluded. Thank you.